Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com, where you can also donate to support our work. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments on Facebook or Instagram. Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. In this episode, we're looking at Matthew 20, 29 through 23, 39 with Dr. Amy Jill Levine. We'll look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, a trilogy of parables, and Jesus' critique of the Pharisees. Uh, Dr. Amy Jill Levine is the Rabbi Stanley M. Kessler Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. Uh, she's also a university professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies Emerita, Mary Jane Worthen, professor of Jewish Studies Emerita, and professor of New Testament Studies Emerita at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Levine is uh, the author of a number of important books, and you can take a look at our website where we've listed a number that you can see uh, for yourself, but I'll mention just a couple right now. Uh, Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi, um, as well as uh, The Pharisees, which was edited, which was edited uh, by her and Joseph Sievers, and that came out with Erdman's just recently in 2021. And uh, this one's relevant because we're going to be talking about Matthew 23, uh, and the Pharisees come up a number of times in our conversation. Thanks for joining us, AJ. Oh, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you. So, AJ, we'd like to start by asking our guests what drew them to these particular texts in the Bible. So what drew you first to the book of Matthew? Well, when I first started studying this stuff on a formal level, people kept telling me that Matthew was the most Jewish of the Gospels. And I looked at it and went, yeah, I can see some connections there. So I thought there was a personal affinity. Um, and I had gone to Duke to work with W.D. Davies, who was a Matthew expert. So I thought, well, that would make some sense. Uh, so because of the course offerings and because of what I heard, it seemed like Matthew would be a good text to work on. My original thought would be to work on women in Matthew and then expand that to, to gender and sexuality. Uh, and I got the message uh, more subtly than explicitly from most of the faculty. Why would you want to work on such subjects? That's sort of faddish. You know, why don't you work on something like justification and all? And I thought, oh, you know, God, that's been done. Um, so I eventually wound up working on the, gent the question of the Gentile mission in Matthew and why uh, Matthew repeats, uh, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I wound up working on that. I wanted to call the, the work Matthew and the missionary position, uh, but the good folks at Duke refused that as well. Um, and I didn't start working on the gender and sexuality stuff until after I got tenure because I was even getting uh, noise from my first job that, well, you know, you don't want to work on gender and sex because it's faddish. So that's how I landed in Matthew. And for all that I've written commentaries on Luke and articles on, on John and Mark, I keep getting dragged back to Matthew. It, it won't let me go or I won't let it go. <laughs> now, uh, AJ, how do you see the specific section of Matthew that we're going to talk about, 20 through 23, uh, fitting into the book as a whole. How do, how do you see it relating to what comes before and perhaps after? Yeah, well, this is the part I think after you've been through most of Matthew, that you think, okay, I, I can go take a bathroom break now because you did not give me <laughs> the most exciting parts of Matthew, I have I have to admit. Uh, so the tri you've got the <laughs> triumphal entry, that's nice. Uh, and you've got the temple incident, which is not a cleansing. I mean, he makes a mess. Um, and then you've got that horrible material <clears throat> in chapter 23, which is the woe to you scribes and Pharisees. Um, so it's, you have to get with the program to begin with. I mean, the first four chapters give you the intro and then five through seven, it's the Sermon on the Mount that gives you the what and chapters eight and nine give you the how, and then chapter 10, which is the mission discourse gives you the, okay, here's disciples. Here's what you do. 11 through 12 shows you the results of that mission. Although there's actually no mission in Matthew, including some controversy stories. 13, you get all the parables. 14 through 18, you get the ecclesial discourse. And then yeah, you get how do we live in the church with questions of what we might call family values in 19. And then 21, 20 to 21 is kind of the run-up to the passion. And then you get all the nasty stuff. I mean, <laughs> well, at least Matthew is well organized. I can sort of cite that stuff off the top <laughs> of my head, right? So you can find yeah. your, Matthew's like a driver's ed manual. You can find your way around very, very easily. Yeah. So 
Uh, there is, in this section, I would say, it, it may not be the most exciting parts of Matthew, but to me it's some of the most difficult parts of Matthew. I mean, when I think of the questions that I have about understanding Matthew, a lot of them are all concentrated here. Uh, things that are just confusing and hard to deal with in various ways. And even the Jesus that we encounter here, he seems to have this kind of edge to him that you don't see in other parts of Matthew. I wonder for you... I mean, I was thinking this on my drive over, actually. You know, if I'm reading Matthew 23, you know, or some of the other things we see Jesus doing here, I'm like, am I telling my kid to, like, act like, like that or to not do that? What am I telling my kid? How do, you, how do you do with that? Uh, so we thought we would reach out to you because of the <laughs> difficulty of this section. We really could use your help here. Yeah. What for you? Are there parts that you find difficult here in these chapters? Oh, you mean besides the one you just mentioned? <laughs> well, yeah, of course. And the stuff that I find difficult is, is often stuff that other people don't notice, and that also makes me a little worried. Um, Matthew uses uh, language of disability. Um, you know, so Jesus heals two people who are blind, and that sets you up for this the idea of looking at Pharisees as blind guides. So Matthew uses disability language to suggest uh, spiritual lack. I don't think that's helpful. Uh, Matthew gives us parables in which slaves are hurt or dismembered. Um, and, you know, we just kind of default, oh, this must be servants. It must refer to ancient prophets. Now, in Matthew's context, these are real slaves um, who have a real problem with their bodies being attacked uh, violently. Um, we have this horrible invective against scribes and Pharisees, which runs counter to the Sermon on the Mount, which says, among other things, you know, don't call anybody fool and don't call people names. And now you've got, oh, you, you know, brood of vipers and, and you're terrible people. I mean, uh, which actually lays Matthew up to the charge of hypocrisy, you know. Um, so there's a lot of really difficult stuff here. Um, there's some fulfillment material, which is confusing. Like, does Jesus come into the city riding two donkeys, which would have caught my attention? Um, or is he just kind of sitting on, on, you know, multiple cloaks? This is hard material. Uh, the temple incident is difficult material because we don't actually know what the problem was. Um, uh, we do know that Jesus' followers, including Paul, continued to speak of temple worship as something important, continued to worship in the temple. So what exactly Jesus is trying to do there is difficult. And the takeaway that readers of Matthew get is, boy, read this chunk of Matthew and that whole Jewish system is just hypocritical garbage. And we really ought to invent something new called Christianity. And I don't think that's a good reading of Matthew. And it's certainly not, historically speaking, and it's certainly not a good reading for churches today uh, that are interested in things like God's ongoing covenant with Israel. So this is hard stuff. I, mean, I do think that you, you could potentially make an argument that this section here has the passages that have the potential to be used in anti-Jewish ways more than any other part of Matthew. I mean, do you think that would be fair? I mean, you also have the passage where it says, let his, his blood be on our heads. Yeah, that's, that's 27, 25. Um, or you've, yeah. got, you've got, you know, the, the ending where the, this, this cockamamie story about uh, the, 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 the soldiers fell asleep and then they said to their commanding officers, oh, we fell asleep. Like some soldiers really going to say that in Rome. Yeah, I fell asleep. It's stupid. Um, and then the disciples came and stole the body. Well, if they were asleep, how would they know? So the whole story is nuts. Um, and then Matthew ends, and this story is told among Hoi Yudaioi, uh, the Jews, until this day. And I don't think that the recent translation in the NRSV updated edition to read that as Judeans, the only time the translator for Matthew puts in Judeans is there. And I think that's apologetic. I don't think it's true to Matthew. Right. Yeah. But well, we're grateful to have your insight, particularly for this section, because of that potential that it has. And you've already alluded to ways that you might help us read it in a different way that wouldn't push us in that direction. So as we go through our conversation, we look forward to hearing about that. All right, AJ. In Matthew 20, verse 29 through 21 to 27, we have a number of events here. So mm -hmm. Jesus heals two blind men. Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey or don multiple donkeys. donkeys. Jesus <laughs> enters and cleanses the temple. He curses the fig tree. And Jesus is asked about the source of his authority. Are there any major themes that you think uh, holds this together uh, that Matthew's repeated, repeatedly, let's say, developing here? And can you, how would you walk us through this kind of yeah. section? 
Um, I, I don't like the idea of reading Matthew in chunks, as one might do in a, in a lectionary preaching church. I mean, I think Matthew was originally designed to be heard in one sitting. Like you can sit through a movie, you can sit through Matthew. You might take a bathroom break or go to the vomitorium or whatever you would do back then. But, but I do think it's meant to be heard as a whole. So you start getting these textual echoes um, as if you go to a symphony and you have a theme that's established in the first movement and then you pick it up in the second movement in a minor key and then you pick it up in different instruments on the third. So there's a bunch of stuff here that we've seen before. Um, when, uh, when Jesus gets called um, son of David, like, Lord, have mercy on me, son of David, that sends you automatically back to the genealogy, which is, you know, Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David. You get a connection with Solomon, who was a healer. Um, you get the anticipation of Hosanna to the son of David um, or the children in the temple crying out. So all that David stuff is going to come back here in, in, a, in a, a huge measure um, or Jesus' own quotation from Psalm 110 about, you know, the, the son of David. Um, we get the idea of the Messiah as one who displays mercy, and that goes back to the Beatitudes. We get the the entry into Jerusalem, which is all in a tumult, and that would not be surprising because in the Christmas story, um, when the when the Magi, who are not wise men, they're Persian astrologers, they're not really wise because they say to Herod, who's a paranoid megalomaniac, where's the one born king of the Jews? Not a great question. <laughs> um, but we find out that all Jerusalem is disturbed, and then Jerusalem gets disturbed again. Um, we have the importance of faith, which has been all the way through. Um, Matthew tends to put in faith where Mark just has something else like works. Um, so the idea of, you know, if you ask anything in faith, faith, faith can help you move mountains, which, you know, unless you're doing road construction, I'm not sure why anybody would want to do that. Um, we've got concerns for the authority of Jesus, which is going to come back in the Great Commission, where Jesus says, now all authority has been given to me. Um, so there's a change in his status. And therefore, there's a change in the mission. Now, therefore, go make disciples of all the Gentiles. You get competition with the Pharisees, which had been signaled from way, way back. Um, uh, in Matthew, Matthew likes to combine Pharisees and Sadducees, which is like a really odd combination because they don't get along really well. Um, and Matthew, Matthew does this over against Mark. So this is a Matthean move of combining the two. And you have the, the ramp up to Pharisaic villainy. Um, there's judgment material, which has been all the way through. Um, there's testing of Jesus, which is why people keep asking him questions. And that goes back to the testing by Satan. Uh, and there's Jesus is basically fulfilling everything in the Old Testament, to use the Christian term. So by the time you get up to, you know, chapter 20 or chapter 21 in Matthew, pretty much all the themes have been established. And then it's just a matter of which key Matthew is going to play them on and by which instruments. So there is a lot that we could talk about in this passage, but let's look at the cursing of the fig tree. I think that one is very confusing to a lot of readers, and it pushes, like a lot of these passages here, pushes against some assumptions about Jesus, right? Sure. Jesus is the healer, he brings life, yeah. he's merciful, and yet here he curses and causes a fig tree to wither, and the meaning of this action is unclear. So what's going on there, and particularly the conclusion seems to be, in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 21, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain you mentioned, you know, you can move and cast itself into the sea. So what's going on here? Sure. Well, if we presume that Matthew is using Mark, which strikes me as likely, um, what Mark does is set up the fig tree as the symbolic anticipation of the destruction of Jerusalem and the burning down of the temple, right? So they're heading, the, Jesus and the entourage are heading into Jerusalem. They, Jesus sees the tree. It's not quite the season for figs. He curses the tree. He goes into the temple. He makes a mess. He comes back out the next day. Peter goes, look, that tree is dead. Okay. So it, it wasn't quite the season then, but within the next generation, assuming this, this scene is set somewhere between, say, 27 and 30, in, in the year 66, the war breaks out in 70, Jerusalem is destroyed. So you can see how it functions as a symbolic whatever. Matthew, who doesn't really cue in the symbolism all that well, Jesus curses the fig tree and the fig tree drops dead. Oh, what does this tell us? It tells us that Jesus is a really good miracle worker. Um, and just as he can heal, he can blight, um, he can cure, and he can kill. So he's not really somebody you want to mess around with. I also think that for Matthew, it's got something to do with the destruction of the temple because he's about to go into, into Jerusalem and deal with the temple anyway. Um, 
for Matthew and for many of Jesus' followers following the year 70, how did they explain the destruction of the temple? Oh, well, you know, the Jews killed Jesus and therefore they lost their temple. That would be a logical conclusion to make through theological views. Um, you know, Jews would have other views of this, as would Romans. Uh, when I read the passage, it reminded me of the, the passage earlier where it talks about um, tree. You'll know of a tree by its fruit. Yeah. Use of the language of fruit. Is there something going on? There. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. I mean, you know, some, look, sometimes yeah. a tree refers to other trees, and sometimes a tree is just a tree. Um, so if you want to bring them together, I would have no problem with that. Um, I frequently talk to Matthew to say things like, did you intend this? Uh, to which Matthew's right. response is, well, I can see where you get it. Um, yeah, so if right. you want to do it this way, you can say, well, the Jerusalem is the olive tree, and it wasn't bearing good fruit, so therefore it's to be struck down. So you can do that. You can also move it to John the Baptist as the axe is now laid to the root of the tree and any tree that yeah. does not bear fruit will be chopped down. Um, Jesus doesn't even need a hatchet. He can just do it by words because, again, he's, yeah. you know, he's Jesus. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff works together to develop the metaphor of you have to bear good fruit. Now, this raises a question as to whether trees can change their nature. Um, similarly mm -hmm. with the parable of the sower. I mean, can a seed change? Can ground change? And I'm not convinced that it can um so that leads you to a kind of predestinarian model which is which is a little creepy for a number of folks right you ought to have some sort of free choice in the matter um it, if we want to go there that's going to be something that people are going to have to work out theologically i should also say i've been teaching well before covid in a maximum security prison um and when i mentioned to my guys that soil does not change its nature thorny th soil is just thorny soil and and it, barren soil is barren soil and you know rich soil is rich soil and you get lucky uh my guys in prison keep saying no i'm actually the barren soil and people help me with fertilizer they taught me stuff and people help me by cleaning away the rocks so they got me clean of drugs so i'm soil and i changed and i said to matthew what do you think about that and matthew said i think that's a pretty good reading so um, we, always, we, we don't know what Matthew was thinking. We don't know who Matthew was. We don't know where Matthew was writing. We can only guess on the time. We can only guess on the audience. I think anybody who wants Matthew's writing to anybody is going to read Matthew. Um, but what does the text mean? The meaning is always going to outstrip authorial intent, which we can't get to anyway. Yeah. Uh, now, in verses 15... And 23, we read of the chief priests, scribes, and the elders of the people. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into some of the, some of the other uh, groups. groups that are mentioned. But who are these three groups, the chief priests, scribes, and elders? What's their function and what do they do? Yeah. Well, what I frequently hear in Christian preaching and teaching are these are the religious leaders, as the Pharisees are religious leaders. I don't think that's a terribly helpful term. Because I think the term religion here is just too vague uh, to help us with anything. I think of a religious leader as clergy who gets hired by a synagogue or a church or a mosque. And that's not who these people are. Um, so now we're talking about the upper class in Jerusalem, which was at the time of Jesus and subsequently up to the, the destruction of the temple, just a mess because of uh, colonialism, because Rome stepped in, uh, because Herod messed up uh, who was going to be high priest. Uh, because the high priest is appointed by Pilate, um, and, and Pilate holds the high priestly gown, so, you know, the priest can't do his job without Pilate. So these are the people who are part of the upper class who represent uh, the Judean people to the Roman government. I mean, they're not elected. Uh, they just, you know, they're in the right place at the right time with the right sort of influence. Um, do they run the religion? No. Uh, if we think about the religion as what do people believe and how do people practice. And it, that's all over the place. I mean, they're not telling Essenes what to do, and if they did, the Essenes wouldn't listen. And they're not telling people up in Galilee what to do, and they wouldn't listen either, uh, because you don't have a head Jew to tell Jews what to do. Um, it, when you're in a church situation, this may be more explanation than you need, but I find this helpful. When you're in a church situation, when you get into an institution by belief or by faith, um, then you need some head person to tell you what to believe because you're, you're kind of inventing this as you go along. And there's nothing else holding you together except for particular beliefs and practices. So you need standardization. Um, Jews never settle down just to be a religion or a faith community. 
um, and I know I'm using the term religion somewhat problematically here, but bear with me. Um, Jews are always a people. It's like an ethnic group, or in Hebrew, an am, right? Um, and that means they can believe and practice whatever they want, because at the end of the day, they know they're Jews, and they're not Samaritans, and they're not Gentiles. So these folks aren't leading the religion. They're political, well-positioned, high-status political people in Judea, with the chief priests uh, put into office by Pilate uh, running the temple. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. And I guess when we get to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, then religious beliefs may come into the picture a little bit more? Um, to some extent, yes. If we think about the Sadducees as temple-based and Jerusalem-based, they're not. nobody's listening to them. Um, in fact, Josephus, who's a, Josephus is a priest, um, uh, and he doesn't seem to be a member of any of these groups in particular, but he talks about the... the the Pharisees is having, like, up jump to use the British term. Um, they've gotten ahead of their station because Josephus thinks people ought to be listening to the priests, which is an inherited role. You know, like, we're the traditional leaders. We It's, it's like, you know, the House of Windsor in, in the U.K., right? You ought to pay attention to King Charles. Yeah. Um, Jews are like, we're going to listen to the Pharisees. They're a lay group. We think they've got more credibility than the priests do. And this also shows the problem of lack of consistent leadership at the time. So that when the revolt breaks out, there's there's no set group that had the people's attention sufficiently to stop the revolt. Interesting. Okay. So, so AJ, how are these three groups that, that we, you've just mentioned, how are they functioning here in Matthew's narrative? Okay, so what Matthew likes to do, particularly compared to Mark, is merge all these groups together. So by, as I mentioned at the end, you just have Hoi Yudaioi who were telling this nutty story. So first, Matthew merges together the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we can see that when they come to John the Baptist, right? That's not in Mark. Um, and Luke has a different way of playing those things out. So he first, Matthew first merges Pharisees and Sadducees, and then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and anybody else who looks like they have any sort of leadership role or any sort of public presence, uh, Matthew's just going to mush them all together until they just basically become a bunch of Jews. Um, and they wind up being over against Jesus and his guys. So do you think, I, I wonder, do you think if part of the issue, is part of the issue that Matthew is trying to, I guess, negotiate is here you have the, for Matthew, the son of David, right, who's like the king. And then you have these other, you know, competing political leaders. And yep. so we kind of have a kind of political comp contest and competition between them. I, yes, it's that. But I think you have to, that's a good point. But I think you have to nuance it a little bit. Because Matthew really doesn't like kings, right? Um, you know, you, you first get king, outside of the genealogy, uh, you get king, King Herod the Great, who keeps getting called King Herod. Um, and he's not your greatest role model. Um, or the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. So generally, Matthew doesn't like the idea of kingship. Um, and this whole son of David thing then has to be nuanced away from a type of um, political royal authority and moving towards some sort of servant leadership or eschatological kingship. Hmm, great. Let's move on to chapter 21, verse 28, through chapter 22, verse 14. And here Jesus tells a trilogy of parables. So we get the parable of the two sons, the parable of the wicked tenants, and the parable of the wedding banquet. Before we dive into the details of those parables, Let's zoom out a little bit, and you've written on parables in the past. Can you explain what a parable is, what its purpose is, and how do we think about drawing points from parables? Do they just have one point, or is there more than one way that they can be read? Yeah. Well, standard scholarship on parables, going back to Euler, and this German volume that everybody cites and nobody's read, um, you know, <laughs> suggests that parables have one meaning and you can tease it out. And I, I don't think that's helpful, because once you tell a story, it's going to have multiple meanings. But I don't think it's a free-for-all. I don't think it can mean anything you want um, because parables are embedded in a larger gospel. Um, so we have to figure out how does this parable function within this particular narrative context. Um, Matthew and parables, parables, what, the, the old explanation, they're designed to tease the mind into active imagination. In other words, you're supposed to think about them. Um, uh, you can look at parables as somewhat like jokes. Either you get them or you don't. And if you analyze them too much, it kind of loses the power. Oh, that's no longer funny. You know, that I've, I've spent five pages on the theory. Um, I, I think parables help you see the world otherwise, give you a different perspective on the way things are. Uh, parables can be shocking. Uh, parables can use bizarre imagery. Stuff happens in parables that doesn't necessarily happen in the real world. 
Um, like uh, mustard seed does not grow into a giant tree such that birds of heaven can nest in its branches. It goes into maybe a five foot shrub and no bird is gonna nest there because ground animals can, can climb up the, the bark and get to it. Um, uh, you know, hiding, hiding, which is the right word, um, uh, yeast in, in uh, three measures of flour gets you about 60 pounds of flour. That's a lot of yeast and that's a lot of bread. So I mean, there's all sorts of bizarre stuff going on in parables. Uh, what we typically do is we either, we modern people reading this stuff, and in fact, the ancient people, it, it, they made it all Christological, so the parables are always telling you something about Jesus as the Christ, which I don't think they originally doing, because when Jesus is telling these parables, people aren't saying, oh, he, this, is, this is the guy who died for our sins, right? Because he hasn't died yet. Um, so the parables have to have some sort of other message, which I think is about this coming kingdom, uh, rather than autobio uh, completely autobiographical about Jesus himself. When you start getting some of the parables moving up toward the passion narrative, you get, I think you get a little bit more autobiographical stuff, like the wicked tenants who kill the son. Oh, a bunch of people who kill the son. Well, that sounds like what's going to come up in the passion narrative. <laughs> Um, right. You know, we don't know if Jesus told all these parables. We don't know if Jesus told any of them, but my sense is he probably did. Um, and then the gospel writers have to figure out where to put them because I don't think he just, you know, told them as a one off. I think like a, a good singer or a bard, um, he'd go from town to town and people would say, oh, do the one about the, the laborers in the vineyard who all got paid the same amount. You know, we like that one. Or, you know, oh, I heard this other one, you know, uh, the, the prodigal son of Matthew's going, nah, I don't like that one. Um, so th they got to figure out, the gospel writers have to figure out where to put them, who the audience is, uh, and how the narrative is going to work on this. Um, the parables also come to us in different forms, by the way. So manuscript attestation will differ particularly on the parable of the two sons, which in manuscript form is just a mess. Oh, is it? So what are the purpose, what's the purpose of these three parables here? What role are they playing in Matthew? So the, th the three parables are the parable of the two sons, right? We have uh, a father tells his sons to go work in a vineyard. One of them uh, says, uh, I, okay, I'll go. He doesn't go. The other one says, doesn't go, and then changes his mind and ends up going. And then the second one is the parable of the, the tenants, right? The landowner owns a vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, he's trying to go get get the fruit from the vineyard, sends his servants, and then and then his son, and they basically beat and then kill the son. And then the third one's the parable of the um, wedding banquet, where a king holds it's a it's a wedding banquet for his son, and it sends the invitations out. People don't come, and then finally, uh, there's this. We'll come to this in a little bit. This person there who's not properly clothed. Yeah, the so guy, those are the, guy the three parables. The dress code. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, so the parable of the two sons, which I've been thinking about a lot because I have a, a graduate student work with me named Tyler Culp, who's really interested in this parable. Um, okay. And what he points out is uh, it's not just which son did the right thing, but what, when Jesus says which one did the right thing, what kind of answer are you going to get? And as Tyler points out in, in, the, in the Western tradition, in Codex Bezai, um, or D, um, the answer is the one who said he was going to go and didn't, um, which is counterintuitive. But if if you really want to ratchet up how venal the high priests are and what hypocrites they are, that's the right answer. So how do we know what Matthew wrote originally? Because you could make an argument for uh, for different ways that this parable is going to play out. Um, is it just the two sons? I mean, the, the answer, the one who did the work, it's obviously the right answer. Uh, but if you want to set up a group of hypocrites, then you have them give what's obviously the morally incorrect answer. Mm -hmm. All right, so, the, our, so parables confuse us. Um, in terms of the parable of the wicked tenants, as I mentioned, I'm really concerned about those initial slaves who go and get beaten up. And why don't we pay attention to them? Um, and why aren't we looking at slave language? Um, the parable of the wedding banquet, is, which is just a mess. Oh, I think I'll go and destroy that city and then, you know, issue invitations to a bunch of other people that I will force in, like dragging them in off the street. And then this poor schmuck without a wedding garment gets thrown into the outer darkness with his wailing and gnashing of teeth. And he was just thinking maybe I could get dinner. Um, what Matthew generally does is ratchet up the violence of the parables. So when you have parables in the triple tradition, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or just in Mark, um, and in some cases in, in the so-called Q source, which I actually don't think exists, I'm a, I'm a 
Q denier, which I think it makes me a traitor in some circles, but it's okay. Uh, Matthew just makes everything more violent to suggest in this eschatological moment, um, when you get that final judgment, some, some of y'all are just really going to be screwed. And you don't want to be there. So this is that, that kind of shock evangelization. Do this or you're going to go to hell. And it would not yeah, surprise me. So, it, it also would not surprise me, by the way, that some of that goes back to Jesus, who I think probably had a pretty robust idea of what hell was. Yeah. So, so well, I guess I guess the question is, why does Matthew maybe string together these three parables in particular? Like, what are they trying? What is he trying to do with them? What is he trying to, I guess, communicate to his audience when you, you know, you've read these three parables, you know, and they they have the ratcheted up violence, like you nicely pointed out. Yeah. What's he trying to get his audience to, I guess, do well, as a result of hearing them? And now you're asking me to come up with a single meaning of each parable, which I'm I am. <laughs> which, which I'm somewhat resistant to do, but but you know sure. it can be done. So the first one, uh, the two sons, is well, even if you were a sinner and a tax collector. Uh, you get a second chance. So you might have said no initially to the calls for justice and repentance, but then, yeah, in light of Jesus, I think maybe this might be a good idea. So it's not how you start it out, it's how you end, which is kind of what you say about where you go to college and who you marry, right? It's where you, it's where you end up, not necessarily where you start. Um, yeah. The wicked tenants is uh, you people, priests, and it's told to priests, right? Um, and elders, you guys who were supposed to be leading the folks are not doing this. And because you are wicked and because you have not been listening to God's messengers, i.e. the slaves, and because you reject God's son and kill him, i.e. Jesus, the vineyard will be taken from you and given to a nation and ethnos um, uh, worthy of it. So in other words, whatever political authority you have is going to be removed from you and given to someone else. And then we can we can debate whether this other ethnos is Rome coming in or whether it's the church or whether it's some other group. We don't know. Um, but it's basically, OK, you guys who were leaders in the local community, you blew it. Uh, you blew it big time. You're guilty. You deserve to be disenfranchised. Okay? Uh, and the parable of the wedding banquet is you got to get your act together because it's eventually going to be too late. Um, the idea of kings holding banquets, I mean, you find this in, in, in Midrash and Jewish sources as well. And it's also also various questions about who gets invited and who gets to eat and who gets to taste the dinner. Um, so these are standard forms. Um, I think Matthew is very concerned about good works. Um, so with the parable of the wedding banquet, um, uh, not dissimilar to the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, Um you know, if, if you don't have the stuff that you need, eventually it's going to be too late. You come in without the garment, you have you don't have enough oil, you're lacking something. And then by the time you get up to chapter 25, you find out what it is you're lacking. Did you feed me when I was hungry? Did you clothe me when I was naked? Did you visit me when I was in prison? So as yeah. Matthew, yeah, as, that's, that's... Right, as Jesus would put it in Matthew, um, if, if Jesus were reading James, you know, faith without works is dead. Matthew would agree with that. So, oh, that's yeah, all that that's theory. great. I ask this to my students, right? Yeah. I'll have them read these three parables, and then I'll have them, uh, I'll ask them, like, who is this man, right? Who does he represent for Matthew? Does he yeah. represent anyone in particular? And what is the wedding robe represent? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, how, what, how, how do you take this? It sounds like you're taking the garment to represent, um, I guess, the de deeds or good works. Does that sound right? It's the easiest reading for Matthew. It doesn't mean it's the only reading, and it doesn't mean it's the right reading, sure. but it's the easiest one to pull from Matthew, given themes that Matthew has been sounding pretty much since the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. 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 The, um, yeah. The, uh, one, way, one way I've read it, and I'd be curious to hear what you think of this, uh, is that in the three parables, so he seems to be addressing, you know, the, the leaders that he's been interacting with, who, you know, who, or who Jesus has been kind of in context with. Yeah. And so uh, for, I think for Matthew, they're not repenting because of their, partly because of their, um, the way they don't identify Jesus as the son of David as they ought to. But when you get to, th I think when you get to this person at the end, uh, is that if, I think if you follow the three parables, when you get to the third parable and you look at kind of the um, uh, the sequence of judgment, 
uh, is that you have the you've already done the sequence of judgment that falls upon for Matthew the the leaders that he's been criticizing. Now you have this person right who's just found himself in the in the wedding banquet. And I've kind of thought, well, so this is now no longer where he's not talking about the, you know, the chief priests, the Pharisees or the scribes who, you know, who he's identified. Now he's just talking. It seems like he's talking to, to anyone who would be listening to uh, this kind of critique that has already happened in the first two parables. It's like any anyone who's listening to Jesus who might even be thinking, oh, yeah, get those, you know, get those Jewish leaders, get those scribes or those Pharisees or whatever. And now it almost, it, it almost seems like Matthew's turning the table mm. on, on you, you right. know, whoever you may be, um, so that I think for Matthew, maybe the same fate would fall upon, you know, anyone. Yeah. Uh, what, does that sound like a reasonable reading to you, or what do you make of that? Sure. Um, if you have Matthew arguing against chief priests or Pharisees in chapter 23, um, those arguments have to land somewhere for the congregation themselves. Um, so sometimes it's the negative model. You don't want to be like Pharisees who do X, Y, and Z, so you want to do the opposite. Um, and sometimes it's a general threat out there. Um, so Matthew, Matthew is just keeping everybody on their toes, in effect, saying if, you, if you're out of the Jesus thing, you might get another chance. I mean, Matthew never ends the mission to the Jews, right? The Great Commission is, you know, forget those Jews, just go to the Gentiles, right? That's not it, right? It's just an extension. So first you have go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and now you have go to the Gentiles, right? Um, and it may be that Matthew expects that some of those folks are eventually going to come on, but I think the, the message is primarily Gentile-focused, and therefore it's for everybody. So, yeah, um, is the guy without the garment a chief priest? Well, you could make the case because he has to rely on Paul on, on Pilate to get those garments. I think it's everybody. I think everybody ought to be nervous reading Matthew. Yeah. Well, you true. know, if, if the Pharisees, if it, you know, it's Sermon on the Mount, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. He's not saying you have to be better than a Nazi child molester, right? Um, so he's he's setting the bar pretty high. And if the Pharisees are screwed, wow, we really better get our act together. And there's all that mercy of the cross and ransom for many and all that other stuff. But, boy, if you don't have that garment or you don't have that oil or you haven't visited people in prison, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're baptized and you preach the gospel and you say, Lord, Lord, every morning, you're screwed. Well, we move on now from a series of three parables to a series of three questions. So Matthew loves to work in the trees. Yeah. <clears throat> so these three questions are put to Jesus by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, we touched on this briefly earlier, but could you explain to us the distinction between Pharisees and Sadducees? Because that becomes relevant in these questions they pose here. Sure. Well, I mean, the first problem is figuring out what sources we use to try to determine who these folks are. We have nothing from Sadducees, zero zip. Um, unless you think the Dead Sea Scrolls are Sadducee, which I don't, but I mean, they could be. They have a kind of priestly aura to them. Uh, the only Pharisee from whom we've got written records is Paul of Tarsus, and Paul is a special Pharisee. Um, I don't think Paul uh, gives up being a Pharisee when he becomes a follower of Jesus. He's just a Pharisee who now happens to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he's an eschatological or messianic Pharisee. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the, these folks called the seekers after smooth things. They make stuff easy. Uh, they look like the Pharisees. And in our Pharisees book, which you mentioned before that I co-edited with Joseph Sievers, and Joseph did most of the heavy lifting, um, uh, we've got a number of articles that quadrangulate from what the rabbis say about Pharisees and Sadducees. Rabbis don't think they're Pharisees, by the way. Um, that only comes in the Middle Ages where, oh, it looks like we're Pharisees. Um, it, what the rabbis say about Pharisees, what Paul suggests, what the Dead Sea Scrolls suggests, and what the New Testament suggests, and what Josephus suggests, and you can put it all together, and what you kind of get um, is that Pharisees are actually making things easier for people um, because they know that folks are going to do stuff that God doesn't want them to do. So since they're going to do it anyway, Pharisees say, if you're going to do it anyway, at least do this, right? Um, you, get a, you get an idea of this in Jesus' comments uh, in Matthew which, uh, on the, the divorce legislation. Um, pick, pick, and this is picking up from Mark, but Matthew develops it with the porneo, the loophole clause, right? 
Um, the Pharisees are saying, well, you know, divorce is probably not a good idea, but since you're going to do it anyway, do it the following ways. Um, and Jesus says it's not a good idea, don't do it, period, except in cases of pornea. Uh, the Pharisees seem to be interested in uh, extending priestly privilege, so just as priests in the temple would wash their hands before approaching the elements, pagan priests would do the same thing. The Pharisees are saying, well, why don't we all be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? Thank you, Book of Exodus. Um, so the lay people who are not descended from priesthood, again, priesthood in Judaism is inherited. Um, if your father's a priest, you are a priest. And if your father's not a priest, there's nothing you can do to make yourself a priest. But you too can wash your hands before you eat, and therefore you can be like priests in the temple. Um, and, and your table can be like the temple altar. So how cool is that? Um, so the Pharisees are interested in enfranchising the laity. Um, Josephus, who don't like them very much, says that basically they walk the walk as well as talk the talk. They like simple things. They're out there among the people. Uh, Matthew says about Pharisees in that, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, cha in chapter 23, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because you go across sea and land to make a single proselyte. He's not talking about bringing Gentiles in. Uh, he's talking about Pharisees who are trying to bring other people along with the Pharisaic cause, which means they're not staying away from people. And all that stuff about Pharisees, it comes from the name, the word to separate pollution. Therefore, they're separated from people. Well, we don't know that. Um, the, the same uh, root can give you a sense of interpreter um, or explainer. And if the word does come from a sense of being separated, then you have to figure out separated from what? And there's no reason to think that they're separated from other people, um, maybe separated from sin or maybe separated from certain types of impurity. Um, but this also gets us what we might be called the, the etymological fallacy. I mean, just because somebody has a name, it doesn't tell you much about what they believe or where they're from, or even if the name was originally something that they claimed themselves. Now, a, a common popular distinction between Pharisees and Sadducees is that unlike the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection yeah. and the Sadducees didn't. And that's what motivates the Sadducees question here in this passage. Is that a, a fair way of I mean, it's simplistic, but is it still accurate? Yeah, it seems to be accurate. Um, we have it in Josephus. We have it in the Book of Acts. Uh, we've got it in, in the Gospels. Um, so Pharisees apparently believed in resurrection of the dead. They had a more expanded canon. It looks like the canon for the Sadducees was just the Pentateuch, as it would also be for the Samaritans, uh, for the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, so Pharisees apparently have a broader view of Scripture, which includes resurrection. You know, find hints of it in Isaiah 27. 24 to 27, or Daniel. Um, so, yeah, that's a major distinction. I think the Sadducees question is a really good question, by the way. You know, if you have a multiply married woman, whose wife is she in the resurrection? I mean, that's <laughs> that's an interesting question, uh, particularly for people who have been, say, widowed and, and, then, and then remarried. Sure. Um, and Jesus finesses the question, as he typically does. Um, it, this is an important question, and I don't think it's, it's particularly helpful for pastors to say, oh, you know, in the resurrection, our love is, is so all-inclusive that we have every we love everybody equally. Well, I don't want to hear that. I want to be with my husband, and I want a relationship with him. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is my wife's least favorite passage. Uh, yeah, I don't like it either. Um, and I think, it, I think if you talk to Jesus about this or you talk to Matthew about this, uh, Matthew would say, oh, well, you know, it's, we're all kind of being eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and we don't pair bond. Oh, hmm, not happy with that, but, you know, what can you do? <laughs> okay. So, the, so the, 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 here, here with these three questions, we have the Pharisees, who said, you know, go, they ask one question, then the Sadducees, and then third, the, the Pharisees, you know, send someone to ask a question, right? Um, it's interesting, the language, uh, the Pharisees, uh, they sent their disciples to him. That's yeah. interesting, along with the Herodians. Um, but the, the three questions are, are like this. The, so the first one that the Pharisees send their disciples to ask is about whether it's right to pay taxes to Caesar. Yep. And then the one after that is the Sadducees construct this scenario, like you mentioned, of a woman whose husband dies and has no children. So then um, the deceased husband's brother has to marry her and provide offspring to her, to uh, presumably for her brother, 
this brother dies and the cycle repeats with all seven brothers, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and the question is, well, whose will she be in the resurrection? And then the third question comes from the Pharisees, um, an expert of the law, uh, and who asked Jesus about the greatest commandment. Yeah. So why has Matthew strung together uh, these three questions? Matthew's peppering Jesus, you know, question after question. Well, what's... What are they hoping to accomplish in the narrative, and and like what, what's Matthew doing here? Sure. Well, Matthew's following Mark, right? So your first question is, why did Mark string all this stuff together? Yeah, sure. Um, but what Matthew does is also change Mark. So for the last one, which is which is the sticky one about what's the greatest commandment, which is a good question. I mean, they're all actually pretty good questions, um, uh, because there are six traditionally six hundred and thirteen commandments. And as we know from, among other things, Matthew 23, that there are weightier commandments and less weightier commandments. Weightier commandments like, you know, love, love the Lord your God and less weighty like tithe cumin. Um, so the idea is, you know, what's the most important? Well, that makes some sense. In Mark, it's a scribe who has nothing to do with the Pharisees who asked the question. Um, and uh, he, he hails Jesus for saying, you know, fellow, you've been giving some really good answers. And then Jesus gives the answer, and the scribe goes, great answer, you know, love of God and love of neighbors is more important than all those burnt offerings. Um, and Jesus praises him. You know, like, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And what does Matthew do? Rewrite the whole thing. So it's no longer a scribe, but it's a lawyer sent from a contingent of Pharisees, and he's there to test Jesus rather than to, which is an icky sort of thing, is what Satan does, right? Mm -hmm. um, rather than, because he's really interested in, in the answer. Um, and there's no affirmation at the end. So Matthew was taking actually a pretty good scene from the Gospel of Mark and turned it into more, just more anti-Pharisaic polemic. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, after they've asked him these questions, yeah. then Jesus turns the tables and asks them a question. So he says, whose son is the Messiah? To which they respond that he's David's son. And then Jesus cites from Psalm 110, yeah. the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then Jesus says, okay, if David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? So what is the logic behind this little interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees here? Yeah, which pretty much only works in Greek rather than in Hebrew, which is just another way of mm. playing this thing out. Because in, in Hebrew, you, you, you know who like the Lord is. That's, that's the YHWH Lord. Um, right. So what what Jesus is doing is playing with a text whose textual history is just really a mess. Um, but you could do that back then. You could repurpose a text. We, God, heaven knows Matthew has been repurposing text, you know, right from the beginning with all those strange fulfillment quotations. So this is just Jesus playing at Matthew's game. Um, it works in Greek. If you want more on this, I have this lovely book called The Bible With and Without Jesus, where we give this whole thing. Uh, because Psalm 110 is, is repurposed in a bunch of different places. Um, we give it a whole chapter to say, here's how Jews have been reading Psalm 110, and here's how the Jesus tradition reads Psalm 110, and here's how the Epistle of the Hebrews reads it, and here's how rabbinic sources read it. But what we've got here so is, is this thing, a, a Greek versus a Hebrew reading. Right. Is this the gotcha moment that it seems to be? when, when Like when Jesus has this interaction with them, would they have thought, oh, you got us? Well, for Matthew, sure, that? because they're right, they stop asking him questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just, the tax thing didn't work, and and the the multiply married woman and the resurrection didn't work, and this business about the greatest commandment didn't work, and then he's going to turn and ask his own question, and and boy, we're now screwed. Um, you know, you can match these things up with the four questions that are asked at the Passover Seder too. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with this where you have the wise question and the smart alecky question and the simple question and, and the, the guy who can't ask a question at all, and then Jesus starts doing it. So, of course, Jesus wins. It's his text. You know, if the Pharisees had been written the Gospel of, Mar of Matthew, it probably would have come out somewhat differently. Boy, that Jesus can't answer anything. Um, it, it's not a biography. It's a type of ancient propaganda, and Matthew does it very, very well. I also think Jesus yeah. was probably pretty good on his feet. I think he was a smart guy. <laughs> Um, who came yeah. up with some really smart answers. Yeah, yeah. part of what I, the way I also read this is that, you know, we began with the entrance into Jerusalem where the crowds are proclaiming him, you know, Hosanna, son of David. And then in the intervening stretch, we have all this dispute between uh, a number of the, you know, the leadership. Mm -hmm. And which I think that dispute has to 
partly has to has to do with the identity of Jesus as son of David. And so I think I wonder if part of what you know the ending here of um, how can he call how can David call him him uh, what his Lord if he's his son kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, it's almost like he's saying you know you're you're you don't like that um, that I'm son of David. Right, you have a you have a problem with that, you know, moniker or title. But I, it seems like he's saying I'm actually greater than David, mm -hmm. right? So it, it almost I wonder if he's almost upping the ante on the criticism. They don't like something, and he's, he's taking it and ra ratcheting it up, so to speak, even further. I mean, it sounds like something out of Annie. Get your gun. You know, anything you can do, I can do better. So anything that Moses can do, Jesus can do better. And anything that David can do, Jesus can do better. Now, it doesn't mean that Moses and David are bad, because again, you don't want to set the bar really, really low. You think this guy's terrific, and oh my gosh, David is—he's so terrific, and Jesus is even more terrific. And why not? Yeah. Right? That—that that makes right. perfect sense under the circumstances, right? Uh, because Jesus is here, Lord, and Jesus is Messiah, Christos. Um, which Moses and David are not. So, of course, he's going to be one up. But it's also a strong recognition of the importance of these earlier figures. Great. Now, um, in 2019, a German Catholic scholar of Jewish history, Joseph Sievers, and an American Jewish New Testament scholar, yourself, uh, joined forces to convene a conference on the theme of the Pharisees. The conference met in Rome. Uh, it was partially sponsored by the Pontifical Biblical Institute and met at the Gregorian University. And the chief rabbi of Rome offered remarks at the opening session. Uh, and conference participants were invited to a, as you, as you, you call it, an email correspondence, a special audience with, pope, uh, with the Pope, where he read a paper that is now on the Vatican website and has been reprinted in uh, your edited volume here. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the impetus and significance of this conference? I mean, look, po popes and chief rabbis do not usually uh, read papers or offer remarks at the uh, <laughs> biblical studies conferences that I've been to. So yeah. this one must have been especially significant. <laughs> Why did it catch their attention, you think? Uh, the suggestion was originally made by Rabbi, Rabbi David Rosen, who is the interfaith uh, point person for the American Jewish Committee. Uh, he spoke to Joseph Sievers about it. Joseph was based in Rome, and they thought this was a good idea. I was uh, invited to teach uh, that semester, so this is spring 2019, at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. So I was on site anyway, um, and Joseph asked me if I would help do the coordination, help with the invitations. Um, uh, he works primarily in Second Temple Judaism. I work primarily in New Testament. Um, and then help, help get this thing, in effect, off the ground. But again, Joseph did most of the heavy lifting. Um, it, the Pope gave us an audience, the Pope's talk, which uh, Joseph and I and Craig Morrison helped write, because um, you have to, you know, send notes into, you know, what's going on. This. My husband likes to refer to me as the Holy Ghost writer because of this, but that might be a little bit too much. Um, so it was all the participants, international conference, uh, scholars from, from Israel, from the U.K., uh, from Scandinavia, from Germany, from the United States and Canada. It's was just really quite an amazing thing. Um, rabbi Abraham Skorka was there, who's like the Pope's rabbi from when they were both in Argentina. Um, it was a several-day conference, uh, both on-site and videos. I think, that, I think the videos are still up on the Internet somewhere. I've not watched them. I don't like to watch myself on video. Um, really, really helpful. And then at the end of the conference, we, we, we had a better sense of what we didn't know, so that for the book, we invited additional scholars to fill in where we realized we had some gaps. Um, uh, the book is now being translated into German in a more popular version. So we take out most of the Greek and Hebrew and then add in a few more uh, essays for a German-speaking contingent. Um, it, what did we learn? We learned that we don't know as much about the Pharisees as we thought we did. But that's sort of like saying, what do we know about Jesus? Well, yeah, not as much as we thought we did. Um, uh, but we learned a lot about what the Gospels are doing with the Pharisees, uh, Nicodemus uh, and John, or Gamaliel and Acts, uh, how to read Paul as, as engaged in ongoing Jewish practice and belief, but still being an evangelist to the Gentiles, um, how to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, how to read Josephus, um, uh, when the rabbis start talking about Pharisees. And the rabbis will sometimes pair Pharisees and Sadducees as having arguments, and it looks like the rabbis are on the Pharisee side. So that's how you get this kind of rabbinic connection. Uh, 
uh, the medieval formal connection between Pharisees and rabbis, which pretty much all Jews follow today. So what do we do in contemporary contexts where Jews traditionally see ourselves as the heirs of the Pharisees um, and Christians see the Pharisees as representing everything wrong with Judaism? Um, how now do we have this conversation so we don't bear false witness against each other? Um, how does one preach the New Testament? As you mentioned, Matthew 23 is really hard. But Pharisees are shot through Matthew, and they're usually doing the wrong thing. And if you hear Pharisee and you think Jew, which is what most people do, whether they're Jewish or Christian, that's not real helpful. And if for me, when I hear people say, well, I don't mean all Pharisees. Well, that's like saying, you know, the Christians, well, of course, I don't mean all Christians. I mean, it's not real helpful, right? Um, so you have all these excuses that are coming in. And what we need now, as we've seen with with the Pharisees book and ongoing material is better ways of approaching this stuff so that churches do not inculcate or reinforce anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. And it's so easy to do with Matthew. So let's talk about Matthew 23. We get a repeated, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Yeah. So first off, what is this woe language? Is, is Jesus here drawing on a kind of genre that he's using against the Pharisees. And then secondly, what is the hypocrisy that Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of? And it sounds prophetic, and that would make sense too. People at the time didn't think prophecy had ended. The only people who think prophecy had ended are Christians who are looking at select texts. I mean, Josephus calls himself a prophet. He talks about science prophets. He talks about Essene prophets. So they're, you know, they're looking at Jesus. He's a prophet, but more than a prophet. John the Baptist is a prophet, but more than a prophet. It's prophetic. It's prophetic rhetoric. We take this seriously. Somebody says, whoa, well, or oi. It's like, oi, this is not good, right? Pay attention. Um, Luke gives us woes uh, connected in with Beatitudes. So this is Matthew kind of repurposing that, or Luke's repurposing Matthew. Matthew in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are to you this, blessed are to they that. Um, 23, you get the woes. Luke just puts them together. You know, woe to you who are, who are rich now because you will be hungry, something. That's Luke. Okay. So it's a prophetic form. You pay attention. It sounds like a litany. Um, Jesus doesn't like hypocrisy because Jesus wants, and I think Jesus wanted, uh, people's internal heart um, to be in line with what they do so you don't wind up saying one thing and doing something else. That's hypocrisy. Um, you don't put on a mask because it's, it's language from the theater, right? You don't put on a mask of piety uh, when inside you're not being pious at all, but you're all wormy and broody vipery. Um, and brood of vipers is a pretty strong term because back then they thought that vipers ate their way out of the mommy viper. So a brood of vipers is something that kills the parent. Craig Keener's done a lot of really good work on this. I don't want to look at snakes, but I'm, I'm taking his word for it. Um, <laughs> so it's you're ruining your tradition. Um, your your heart is not in it in the right place. Um, you're saying one thing and you're doing something else. Stop that. Now, we have a number of uh, pastors and ministry leaders who listen to the podcast. Um, and in light of like, the sad history of uh, violent anti-Semitism and the way in which Christian preachers have used language from the New Testament, uh, like these words from the Gospels that are on Jesus' lips to stereotype contemporary Jews, how would you suggest, what are some uh, maybe suggestions you would give for how they might approach and communicate or teach from a text like this? Yeah, how much time do we have? Um, because there's no simple answer. There's no quick fix. Um, but there are certain things that can be done. Um, if you are a lectionary church, change the lectionary. Not everything needs to be proclaimed, and certain things that require so much explanation are probably not the best thing to give in a quickie sermon on a Sunday morning. Um, point one. Um, picture me in the back of your church. And don't say anything that's going to get me upset, because if that happens, I'm going to be standing up, clearing my throat in the back of the church. And the last thing you want is an angry middle-aged Jewish woman in the back of your church, because you, you can bet I'm going to be in your face at the meet and greet. Because, you know, I think the gospel can be preached without making Judaism look bad. So if you have to make Jews look bad in order to make Jesus look good, something's gone really, really wrong there. Um, provide better education for your kids so that they can recognize that this is how the rhetoric functions and it's bullying language. And that's, you know, it might have worked back then, um, but just because everybody did it doesn't make it right. Um, today on the schoolyard, lots of people use uh, 
um, certain profane expressions to describe, like, uh, your relationship with your mother. I don't think I have to unpack that too much. Um, just because everybody uses that phrase, it doesn't mean that it's a right thing to say. Insult is never helpful. Um, do a lot more with what could be considered Christian midrash. And this becomes a, a lesson that I have from my own scripture. I mean, there's, there's a, in the synagogue, we read the entire Pentateuch in Hebrew from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy in one year, it's an Orthodox synagogue, and then we rewind and we do it again. And there's some stuff there that's just horrendous. Um, like uh, Deuteronomy, go wipe out the Canaanites, you know, kill them all, right? This is a horrible passage. Um, so what do we do? We tell stories about how um, when the Israelite, uh, when the Israelites were escaping slavery through the sea and Pharaoh's charioteurs get stuck in the mud and the water closes over them and they drown. Well, the Midrash says that the angels went to God to celebrate because the children of Israel are, are being free from slavery. And they find God weeping uncontrollably. And God says to the angels, my children are dying and you're singing praises. And God is talking about the Egyptians. So because Jews know this story, we have these, these filters that come in so that we could read the Pentateuch and, and come out really hating Egyptians, right? Um, you know, 400 years of slavery followed by genocide, not good. But we have these other stories that we read concurrently. And the, the, even little kids know these stories. So we try to read in a way that does not demonize the other. It does not need to make one group look good in order to make another group look bad. Um, we tell stories about righteous Gentiles. So maybe it's about time that the church recognized that Jesus and all his followers were Jews um, and did not give up being Jewish and suddenly convert to something called Christianity, a word Matthew does not know. Um, so it, it's a matter of taking care and figuring out what should get proclaimed, because not everything is. Um, what text should be matched up with some of these texts? Because some of those lectionary pairings are really pretty awful. Um, and then being very careful because words have meaning. Yeah, right. I mean, for a certain, uh, in certain church contexts, there is this feeling that uh, we should preach through every text. I mean, kind of like what you were describing, going through the entire Pentateuch yeah. in a year. So if someone came to this and said, all right, I have to preach this text, uh, is there a way to do it that accomplishes some of those goals? Like, What, what guidance would you provide in order to draw something good for a congregation that could be helpful without going down these problematic roads? Yeah, again, there's no quick fix. But if one is actually going through all of Matthew, then you have at least other verses in Matthew that you can then bring bring to bear on chapter 23. Um, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's the Sermon on the Mount. So say, look, these guys have, they're actually doing a pretty good job. Um, and Jesus is saying you even have to be better than them, right? You have to be better than William Barber and Mother Teresa. Okay. Um, it, that uh, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat to do what they tell you because they've actually got the right interpretation. Um, to recognize that uh, Jesus himself is even more rigorous on the law, or if you prefer, more legalistic. Whenever churches start talking about legalism, you can bet it's going to go downhill. Uh, but if, if you need to use that term, then say, well, Jesus is actually making the law more rigorous and harder and laying heavy burdens on people. Because the law says don't commit adultery. Jesus says don't think about it. And if you think about it, you're already guilty. That's harder. Right? It's thought control. The law says don't commit murder. Jesus says don't be angry. That's harder. It's thought control. Um, so stop worrying about Pharisaic legalism and look to your own tradition. Um, talk about how you, if people um, have gone into a voluntary group like clergy, um, it, to try to do the right thing, then we are going to hold them to a higher standard. And how difficult that is. Um, and, and even pe people in the pulpit can say that. You know, if you're a pastor, you are likely to be held to a higher standard than, you know, the, the guy who's sitting in, in the fourth pew down. Um, that's really hard. Um, talk about how Pharisees are interested in making the law accessible to everybody. They're not stick in the muds. Do not use them to refer to anybody whose policies you don't like. That's not helpful. Yeah. Um, Using Pharisaical as an insult. Or yeah, I just don't think it's no. helpful. 
And it's kind of like saying, boy, that's mighty Christian of you when you're talking about somebody who says you can't live in my neighborhood because you don't go to my church. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's just not a helpful term. Um, uh, it's not fully redeemable, but some of it's correctable. A better education, better helpful education would start. Yeah. Well, yeah. we are grateful for the education yeah. you've provided yeah. us uh, during this episode, walking us through this passage. We just have one final question for you, which we ask all of our guests, which is, do you have something that you would recommend, you know, the blurb that we are so familiar with on the backs of books and biblical studies, anything that you'd like to blurb for us? It doesn't have to be a book. It could be uh, a life hack or a movie that you recently come across or something else that our listeners might want to go check out. Like, what gets me through the day that I like? <laughs> it could be, yeah. <laughs> Besides any of my books or tapes that people ought to read. Um, I'll tell you what, what helps me get through the day. Uh, besides taking time out for family, which I think is really important. Um, I knit. I would blurb ah. knitting. Um, or if you must, crocheting. Um, because it's, it's tactile and it's productive, and you get something at the end, and if you make a mistake, you can start again, and it's okay. Because um, you can't study all the time, and you can't work all the time. Um, so it's a, if for me, it's, it's kind of like meditation, and it's relaxing, and I love the feel of, of silky yarn in my fingers, and I like watching things come together, and I wind up making like a baby blanket for a graduate student that just had a baby, or a prayer shawl for somebody who's in the hospital, or uh, a, a coat for my daughter's dog. I mean, how cool is that? So I recommend yeah. knitting, and I recommend ballroom dancing, because it's good exercise, and it's particularly good exercise for me as a feminist, because I have to let my partner lead. <laughs> Those are two fantastic recommendations. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, AJ, for taking the time to share your expertise with us and with our listeners and walking us through a very difficult uh, passage. Uh, and to those of you listening, thanks for tuning in to the Two Testaments, and uh, thanks for um, yeah taking the time out of your day to listen. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you would go uh, on Apple Podcasts, give us your best five star rating uh, because we got nothing less than five stars in this uh, podcast <laughs> conversation with uh, AJ. Uh, we would appreciate that. And otherwise, there may be a woe to you. <laughs> yeah, woe to you if you don't, or you'll be thrown into the outer darkness with his wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you again, and thanks for listening. The Two Testaments is produced with support from Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to you, our fellow travelers, who support this journey by donating on our website, thetwotestaments.com. Thanks also to Cam Thomas, Joe Zeldner, and the team in the Sanford Faculty Success Center and our student assistants for their help with production, editing, and promotion.